I'm going to do a very special Tao Day video this year and break the fourth wall a bit. If you're a fan worried I might ruin the Viheart brand experience, this video is especially for you. Now, a YouTuber's brand is this delicate thing sustained through collaboration between the artist and audience. If I started younger, I probably would have been more into the social vloggy youtuber -y aspect where we have a community with a name and we do tags and form an identity. Not because that's what younger people do, but because that's the norm. That's the top 10 tips for success on YouTube. And at that point, I wouldn't have known what I want from life well enough to know that's not the direction I want to go in. Some of our inside jokes and by heart lingo would be purposefully created, but some of it would just kind of happen. Like, we've all got our hands on the little Ouija board triangle thingy, but no one feels like they're directing it when all of a sudden we all agree that cats are the waste product of a particularly complicated multidimensional robot. Hmm, kind of makes sense when you think about it. And now that's the truth, or at least it's canon, and after a while, what's the difference? We would be such a good cult. We have so much amazing cult potential. It takes effort to not accidentally become a cult. Anyway, suspension of disbelief is an interesting thing with many varieties. Take the doodling in math class series. Say you're me and you're in math class and your teacher's talking about, well, who knows what your teacher's talking about. Probably a good time to start. This is a standard suspension of disbelief where I write straight up fiction and you enjoy the story. You don't have to think about it very long to realize I'm not talking to myself in a real math class as I draw in real time. It has scripted narration on top of heavily edited film. However, YouTube has some features that traditional film did not, which can lead to a sort of communal, extended suspension of disbelief. Sometimes I get comments asking about what my math teacher thought, or did I get in trouble, responding to the character I play in the video rather than to actual me. I assume a lot of these comments are from folks consciously enjoying taking part in the fiction. And some are probably from folks in that fuzzy suspension of disbelief state where you're going along with a story without really thinking about it. I mean, if they stopped to think about it, they would know that I'm not really in my math class, but they're enjoying a YouTube binge and an extended suspension of disbelief state, so they don't stop to think about it. That would ruin the experience. Overactive suspension of disbelief is common and encouraged in children, but even as adults, it's normal to have knee-jerk emotions based on fiction. Like you have a gut reaction against a stranger on the street, and then you realize they just look like the actor who played the villain in a show you used to watch. Our brains are just really good at giving us fast first impressions based on fictional depictions of people, and then logic catches up, and we either set ourselves straight or rationalize. Sometimes our instinct is to idolize someone that we know we don't actually know, and sometimes there's a bit of a blurred line, say with the bloggers, with branded personalities, where you can feel a bit like you know them, even though you know you're getting a highly curated view of their life. And there can be some beautiful and worthwhile things in that connection if it isn't abused. See, YouTube is like a giant cross-temporal Ouija board with an algorithmic triangly thingy that collaborates with viewers to create the stories you want to hear without you feeling like you're moving the triangly thingy, even though of course you are, along with a million other people. So the triangly thingy, okay, let's actually look this up because I'm sure there's a word for it. The planchette. Recommendation algorithms are a giant million person cross-temporal planchette. Yeah, I was hoping for a funner word. Maybe we can use the English translation, which is planky. The internet is a universal planky that points us to what we want to believe without us feeling like it's our fault. The intended use case of the algorithmic planky is a smooth user experience. I can keep on being a pair of hands doodling in real time in my grade school math class for as long as you want. You never have to see my other kinds of videos or think about the fact that these things take me weeks and I'm a professional in my 30s with a face before off you go to some other story, hopefully one with advertisements because planky's hungry. So, I've been making videos where the story is that I hate pie for eight years, starting with the viral success pie is still wrong, and most recently with alternative pie. But I don't hate pie. I mean, I do honestly think the circle constant should have been tau, but I think pie is fine. There's plenty of unfortunate notational choices that make math confusing, and pie certainly isn't the worst of them. I think celebrating Pi Day is a good thing to do, even if Tau Day is twice as good. And so I celebrate Pi Day loudly and publicly every year with another installment in this manufactured controversy. Anyone who stops to think about it, who stops suspending their disbelief, will realize I'm not a student in algebra class who hates Pi. I'm an artist enjoying engaging an audience with a passionate mathematical experience. But if you're just browsing around, you might not think about it much and move on to something else, thinking, wow, there's some chick who really hates pie, instead of applying your media literacy skills to every single YouTube video you consume ever. 
I mean, if you're not continuously suspending your disbelief while you watch YouTube, it kind of ruins the experience as you realize how much of it is just product placement and sponsorships and shallow clickbait meant to take advantage of the stories we're collaborating with the algorithms to tell. What I mean is, we're not just listening to the stories already there, we're telling stories to ourselves through our searches and clicks and views, and the more shallow the content, the easier we can fit it into our story instead of listening to someone else's. Which is why I try to not be shallow so you can't take my story from me. Anyway, I'd originally heard that Pi is wrong from the mathematician John Conway through word of mouth, and I found some other things people had written about it through the years, but there just wasn't enough righteous anger in these math facts to make a good story. So that was my contribution to humanity, and others joined in, first people I knew, and then people I didn't. And now, instead of me telling the story, Planky can help you do it in whichever way best serves all our secret desires. Our secret desire to be told we're smart and know better than those pie people, if you're on the Tau side, or better than those Tau people, if you start on the pie side, or better because we accept both or don't care, same story. We all want to suspend our disbelief and take part in a fiction where we're better than other people. And what safer, better outlet for that than this fun little controversy about Tau versus pie? We enjoy arguing and engaging with mathematical discourse in a way that harms no one, and that I hope makes people a little bit more conscious of the mechanisms of manufactured controversy. But if I were evil, or maybe just if I got too wrapped up in myself and didn't know better, here's how to ruin everything. Step one, create a group identity around a shared belief. For us, of course, is that Tau rules, Pi rules, we got that down, but it doesn't really matter what it is. It can start as something simple, innocent, enjoyable to argue about without it really mattering. It can even start as an opinion. We'll pivot to bigger and stronger beliefs in phase two. But first, step two, create a body of rhetoric that the group can repeat to defend their belief. We know our talking points, simpler equations, easier to understand. We've got rebuttals to their talking points too. And as the group evolves beyond just being about Tau vs. Pi, we'll expand our talking points to be that it was never really about Pi vs. Tau, it's about revolutionizing education. Or maybe it's about how only truly smart triangles are reasonable and open-minded enough to accept new truths like Tau, but also including the bigger beliefs of phase two. Having multiple layers of rhetoric is good because you can switch when everyone isn't working. Whatabouts and it's really abouts are such good friends. Step three, spread the word. It's all in good fun, at least in phase one. The phase two version is start beef, but you've got to send your people out there to argue and act independently of you. First, I'll send out the Taoists to merely inform and link Pi people to some Tao information. It's educational and just sharing something we love. In this step, we'll recruit more Taoists who want to join the fun and who think the math is interesting and successful conversions make us look legit. And as we get into the habit of Tao bombing people, it's inevitable that at some point someone will go a little over the line. At this point, one might realize that being a leader comes with some responsibility, but you must resist that urge. You can't control other people's actions, and anyway, if some random person is upset about being called a loser for liking pie, it's just because they don't get the joke. They should come join us, not get mad about it. We'll all share a laugh over it so that everyone knows they have permission within the group to make mistakes. Go a little overboard. It's not a big deal. You might recruit some folks, but the goal of this step is to gain enemies. Eventually, someone is bound to overreact, even to the lightest teasing. But in stage one, even someone pretending to be an enemy for fun will do, because we'll pressure them to either admit they're not really against us, which is a win for us, or to become a true enemy, which is a win for me, because now I can move on to... Step four, make your group members feel like the scum of the earth and that everyone hates them. It might seem counterintuitive, also unethical, but this step is so important. I need to constantly put my followers down by using other people's worst words about them. And luckily, we've manufactured some enemies. Don't worry about whether your enemies are actually causing real world harm to anyone. That's not the point. You just want to make your followers feel attacked and disrespected. Think of it as if your enemies' words are swords. And it's not your fault if it hurts your followers when you show them those swords in the face. Don't get distracted by wondering if those swords were actually hurting anyone before you picked them up. Yeah, this metaphor is really working. As our actions escalate in phase two, the responses will too, so I can play on my followers' insecurities and wear down their self-worth until they actually feel hated. 
I mean, we're talking about humans here. We can convince ourselves someone's mad at us if we send a message and don't get a reply in five minutes. So this step is easy. To ruin everything, first I must ruin my followers' lives by making sure they know they are scum. At least, outside of our little group. I understand them. I love them. I need them. And I'm the only one who ever will. I've got to get them feeling really and truly hurt by everyone but us. Because that's when we can... Step five, escalate. We've got to get our group in a story where they're so wrapped up in the fun idea of righteous retaliation that they suspend their disbelief well past when they start to actually cause harm to other people. And real actions feel rhetorical. Of course, it's not my fault if someone I've radicalized goes overboard and does something radical, but when the pie people unfairly blame me, that just gives my followers more reasons to righteously defend me. They have to defend me. I'm all they got. As our actions escalate, our fake enemies become real enemies, confirming everything I drilled into my followers' heads about how universally hated they are, while still keeping the flavor that we are unfairly prosecuted. Step 5. The enemy's beliefs and feelings can be completely dismissed. Make up a catchy story about how the outsiders don't actually even really believe their own beliefs. Fake intellectuals pretend to like pie to sound smart. They're just copying what they're told or are being politically correct. And if they stopped being lazy and learned some math, they'd agree with us. The extreme of this is to make your followers actually believe that others don't even feel what they claim to feel. They're just pretending to feel wronged for sympathy, they're trying to look good to other pie people, or feel pressured to conform. They might be paid actors, but they definitely don't feel what they say they do. Shed some crocodile tears of your own just to make it clear that we don't have to believe them any more than they believe us. It's not about whether your dismissive rhetoric is true, so don't get distracted by trying to find out if they're actually being paid or would actually agree with you if they knew more math. That's not the point. The point is to give your followers tools to justify thinking they know better than random strangers about those random strangers' own inner life. And in fiction, you can know other people's feelings better than they do because they're not real people. They're characters in our story. This is a big important step past the line into dehumanizing others. Step 7. Benevolent Dictatorship It's not just about pie versus tau anymore, it's about right versus wrong, and who's going to run things when clearly certain folks can't even be honest with themselves about how terrible pie is, and honestly it's pretty magnanimous of us to do this for them considering how much they hate us and how ungrateful they are, but we forgive them and we'll send them to re-education camps to learn about tau. Yes, it's a joke at first, but watch how we get used to the idea. Soon, everyone will forget how to drop the rhetoric and just look at the actual actions people are doing and the results of those actions in reality. You know what step we don't need? Leverage the algorithms. You're already doing it. If you're a space on the Ouija board that some group's collective worst instincts hopes their planky will land on, whether to agree with you or make you a villain, systems exist to find you and add you to their story. Which is great, because your story relies on being other people's villain. And Planky's got it covered! It's no one's fault, we all just secretly ask for permission to hate each other, and somehow all signs point to yes. Did you move it? I didn't move it. Anyway, that's my seven steps to ruining everything. Now, don't forget to apply your media literacy skills. How much do these steps really apply to everything? Did I kind of just make them up? But maybe I'm really good at making up true stuff, because that's a mathematician's job description. Or maybe I'm just trying to sell shirts. Actually, I should totally sell shirts. Yep, they're real now. Proclaim your loyalty in fun summer styles. Available for pre-order for just the next few days, and they'll ship mid-July. What better conversation starter about the joy of mathematics and how to radicalize a following to create global chaos? The green one has it printed on the back, so you can pop on a blazer in the evening for a more formal look. All proceeds go to the supreme triangle who loves us. So happy Tao Day! It's not just me that loves you, the world is full of people who love you and want you to be happy, whether or not you've found them yet. Admittedly, it might be a little harder to find those people if you're okay with hurting others to get what you want, but no one said life is easy. Enjoy your Tao Day! I hope it is double good. Tao is greater than pie. It's not political if it's a fact, right? Wait, what now?